In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. One of the things that I've been taught about preparing sermons, and um, I think many of us that do sermons fail miserably, but one of the things that I was told is, don't ever make it about you. Don't ever make it about you, okay? So I just want everybody to know I did learn that, so I'm gonna, but I'm gonna just take a, a minute to talk about me. And I think it's germane to the story, to the gospel and everything that we're talking about today. But one of the questions I've answered more times than I can recall is why did you become a deacon and not a priest? The implication always being that you chose second place when you could have gone for first. I wish I were able to provide a clear and easy answer. But it isn't. It's a complicated answer. And let me tell you, St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church who was stoned to death for his faith, and lore holds that St. Lawrence, a deacon later in the early church, was roasted over a fire for refusing to fold to the Roman authorities' demands. Now, had I had those two things in my head when I was going through the discernment process, I might have made a different decision. But since we live in a different era, thanks be to God, sort of, um, I chose to go and pursue and I genuinely felt a call to the diaconate. Scripture and tradition tell us of the ultimate sacrifice made by those two deacons. The story, to the best of our knowledge, being true. And I would be lying if I said that I never struggled with the question of priesthood versus diaconate in my discernment through the years and still discerning. We all, everyone here, discerns our calling. You don't have to be ordained to have a collar. You don't have to wear a collar around your neck to have a collar. We all call, have callings. Some pursue ordinations and others not. But as I was in the discernment phase of the ordination process, my spiritual director at the time said, read and reread the ordination for deacons in the Book of Common Prayer. Read it and read it and read it and digest it. So, I did. And this particular phrase is what stuck out, stuck out for me. And to this day, is a phrase that inspires. In that vow, when one is ordained a deacon, one of the things that they are vowing to do is to interpret, this is direct quote, the church, the, you are to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world. I read that part of the ordination vow, and it provided some clarity for me. It gave words to what I was feeling. And you know if you've ever had that happen, where you have some emotion or some feeling with which you're struggling, and then you read something and you're like, aha, aha. Um, so it provided those great words of clarification. And I pray that God will continue to call all of us, all of us, into ministry to be the bridge between the church and the world, as both desperately need each other now, with our world and certainly our country in disarray. I want to say that I've been chastised through the years for having sermons that are, quote, too political. And there have probably been occasions where I did, where I was wanting to have a captive audience to share some ideology, and what better place than church to have a captive audience. But I realized, obviously, that it wasn't about ideology at all. That what we need to be about, and what drives mission, is theology that's rooted in the words and teachings of Jesus. And all of us know what those words are, and we only need to listen. 
but in sharing the line from the Diathlon ordination service, you are to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world. I see that my role is to be political when warranted, to lead and inspire the laity, the ministers of the church, in action and love in action. The last two weeks, I certainly don't need to probably tell anyone here, the Supreme Court has handed us several rulings that in my opinion will bring direct harm to many in our country and world. All of our roles and our goals have changed now and we didn't choose to change them. The court ruled against the Environmental Protection Agency and essentially neutered it with regard to carrying out its critical and absolutely necessary role. I, I, I'm stupefied by that decision. I truly am. Here, six justices, all of whom claim to be people of faith, have little to no regard for what we are doing to God's creation. Yes, I know the forces influencing this ruling are powerful, and I know, we all know, they can be rather mercenary in their ways. But to completely neuter the one agency given charge over our environment, to me, is just appalling. As you know, the other rulings have to do with loosening of gun laws, because why not? We have too few. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Are they so beholden to an organization that threatens them that they just ignore the violence brought about by guns in this country? And of course, the reversal of Roe versus Wade, essentially leaving the laws up to the states. Now, I want to be clear. I understand that many hold nuanced and different views on abortion. And I respect that. I do understand. However, this particular ruling is against what the majorities of people in this country do believe is a woman's right. I'm not saying it's always majority rule, but sometimes that can be not always a good thing. We need to protect people who have views that are, do not gel with the majority of the country. While we're not bound, like some faith traditions, to adhere to all positions of the Episcopal Church, the Church supports the right of a woman to choose their care and treatment, including abortion. What I fear in this decision most of all is the utter disregard for poor women inherent in it. And what I fear, maybe even more actually, is that some women will face unregulated and unsafe abortions in unsafe places without any medical supervision. I fear that. We know that we fear that because that was the case before Roe. What is sad to me is the extent to which the Supreme Court decisions are further dividing an already fractured and vulnerable country. They're bending the bonds of affection to the breaking point. In Luke's Gospel today, we hear Jesus sending out 70 of his followers. As he says, whenever you enter a town and its people, Welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even in the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protests against you. You know this, the kingdom of God is near. Jesus was warning the disciples as to how they might not be accepted warning them of the travails they will face, preparing them for the mission at hand, and letting them know that it will be daunting at times. But Jesus knew all truth. 
and we merely stumble in our attempts to know it. Jesus, in mind you, is reaching through time to help Christians aspire towards truth, to aspire towards faith, to always seek that goal of, through our faith, seeking truth. And we may miss the mark, and we often do, but if we try to discern with love that which guides us, we can be on the right track. We do have the tenets of our faith to help us as we often awkwardly and imperfectly search for that elusive truth. Speaking of truth, or at least something that I think leads us to the truth, Richard Hooker. Anybody, is that name familiar? Stephen, it doesn't count. Um, Richard Hooker, a Church of England priest and theologian in the late 1500s and early 1600s, talked about how our faith is based on what he described as a three-legged stool. Now, I'm on a four, I think, here, but a three-legged stool, and each stool representing something. One stool, one, one leg representing scripture, one tradition, and one reason. And if the stool were robbed of one leg, it is obviously destabilized. Love makes a four or five-legged stool, and action could be another. And so may scripture, tradition, and reason guide us at this time of great division. May it help us search for truth. May it help, for, help us to have bonds of affection, even with those we disagree. Scripture, tradition, and reason accompany us as we find new ways to fight for God's creation when there are seemingly irreconcilable differences. Even when the odds seem insurmountable, we have Jesus. And through Jesus, our charge is to love, and loving often calls us to call those with whom we disagree, those making laws, those passing laws, and those enshrining laws in the Constitution. We do have the right to say we disagree. And we disagree in love, but we disagree. We need to learn how to rejoice when we have no need to wipe the dust off our feet. But to be brave when we must. We must be brave in those moments where we just brush that dust off our feet. And to rejoice when we can, but to love always, even when it's difficult. To remember the words of Jesus to his 70 followers as he sent them. We need to focus on those, meditate on those, and meditate on the good news. And oftentimes good news can come with bad. The two things are not mutually exclusive. So as we look at the actions of the Supreme Court over the last two weeks, we can take heart in the fact that we have Jesus, we have our faith, we have each other, and perhaps those words of the Supreme Court will not be the last words. Pray God. Amen.